Good morning. There is another uh, scripture reading from Hebrews, and unless anybody's going to run up and read it, I'll read it for us. So if you want to turn, or it's Hebrews chapter 4, the New Testament lesson. Therefore, since the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us be careful that none of you be found to have fallen short of it. For we also have had the good news proclaimed to us just as they did. But the message they heard was of no value to them because they did not share the faith of those who obeyed. Now we who have believed entered that rest, just as God has said. So I declared on oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. And yet his works have been finished since the creation of the world. For somewhere he has spoken about the seventh day in these words. On the seventh day, God rested from all his works. And again in the passage above, he says, they shall never enter my rest. Therefore, since it still remains for some to enter that rest, and since those who formerly had the good news proclaimed to them did not go in because of their disobedience, God again set a certain day, calling it today. This he did when a long time ago he spoke through David, as in the passage already quoted. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken later about another day. There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from their works, just as God did from his. Let us, therefore, make every effort to enter that rest, so that no, no one will perish by following their example of disobedience. Praise to God for his word. So this has been a very crazy week. <laughs> I feel like, in a, in a way, I just am watching it all happen and just kind of being like, what, what is happening and trying to respond, and, and I'm reading the news headlines and getting caught up in, in what's happening and what's being reported, and then I get this message that school is closed for two weeks, and it's like, this is crazy, right? And just finding my emotions riding that wave as well of news reports and things closing, and, and then I'm reading the scriptures that Brandon laid out for this week, and and I'm grateful. I'm grateful for these scriptures, this word of God, because the God that we read about hasn't changed. The God of the Old Testament, the New Testament, is the same God of today. And I'm grateful that the Lord lined up the timing that my week would be focused on these scriptures alongside with the chaos that's going on, because these are anchors for my soul and your soul. And so today we're really going to look at the story in Exodus, the story when God gives manna. And here we see a God that is faithful and a giver of good gifts. Everything that the Israelites needed, he provided. And that invitation is for us today. The God who is a giver of good gifts to the Israelites is the God who's the giver of good gifts to us today. So why don't we turn in our Bibles back to Exodus 16. And as we're reading and diving into this story, my prayer is that we find rest in his presence. So Exodus 16 starts off in verse 1 with just kind of laying out a bit of the timing of what's going on. And we read here that it's the 15th day of the second month after they've come out of Egypt. So the Israelites have been living in captivity under Egypt, in Egypt, for a long time. And now we're about six weeks after they've left Egypt, and they have experienced a lot of crazy, right? The whole way that they've lived and they've known life has drastically changed from the security and the knowing of what day-to-day -day looks like, be it slavery, but they knew. They knew what their lives were like in Egypt. And now we're six weeks later, and they're in the desert, and they're following Moses and Aaron, who's following this cloud and this pillar of fire. And we meet them here, and they're grumbling. But really, let's think about it. Like, they have left their homes. They've lived through and experienced the ten plagues, which would have been 
remarkable. And I'm sure they looked at each other and said, this is crazy when there's frogs and locusts and everything else that they experienced. They went through the dramatic first Passover. Then they left Egypt and crossed the Red Sea on dry land and then looked back to see their oppressors die by those same waters that had parted for them. And now they are entering into the desert. And like we said, they're grumbling. They're hungry, or they think they're hungry, or they're anticipating they're going to be hungry. Because after six weeks, most of their provisions are likely coming to the lower end of their supply. They were able to take livestock and riches but really, there's not a lot of convenience stores to use these riches to buy food. And their livestock, we're not sure if they were eating them or if they weren't, based on different laws and things at the time. But they probably weren't starving, but they were anticipating starving. And as I put myself in that situation, I'm like, oh yeah, I'd be number one grumbler. Like, really? If I know I'm not going to have food, or my food supply is depleting, or... I'm not providing for my children or my husband meals. Like, that's my life, right? I cook meals, I feed them, I clean up. Repeat. And when I don't have the, the, the resources to do that, I would feel that panic, right? The Israelites are in a real situation here. They're really worried. There's a real sense of panic growing amongst themselves. And they began to grumble, as I would too. There's a real fear of what is going to happen next to them. And we see in verse 4 to 5, the Lord respond. And he says to Moses, and he says, I'm going to rain down bread from heaven for you. The Lord hears this grumbling and he hears and he sees his people and he says, I'm going to meet your need. I know what you need day by day. This is our God, a God of provision, a God who's faithful and dependable. So Moses and Aaron go out to the, go out to the Israelites to tell them the plan. God is going to rain down bread and provide quail. And as Aaron is talking to the Israelite community, I just love that Moses decides to include this in his account of this story in verse 10. And while Aaron is speaking to the whole Israelite community, they look towards the desert, and there was the glory of the Lord appearing in the cloud. And out of the whole story that he pauses and he makes mention that God's glory it was just right there. And so God has been leading them through this with this cloud or with a pillar of fire. And that's so that they've come custom to that. But to pause in the story of God's going to provide bread. Oh, and by the way, God's glory is still here. God hasn't led them into the desert to abandon them. But he's led them into the desert to continue to show that he is their God. And he is there with them. Since their departure from Egypt, God has not left them. And in this moment of crisis, anticipation of hunger, God has not left them, but yet he is faithful and is providing for them. In verse 12, he says, I'm doing this so that you may know that I am the Lord your God. And then it comes to be. In the evening, quail shows up, and in the morning, manna is there, just as the Lord promised. And the Israelites go through a bit of a learning curve as to what does it mean to live by manna? What does it mean to trust that God is going to provide every day the right amount of food? And we see them fail. We see them hoard the manna, stockpile the manna, because there's no certainty yet in their lives that there's going to be manna again tomorrow. How true is that of our human nature, that in the anticipated, I don't know if there'll be enough tomorrow, that we bring in more than we need? And yet the Israelites learn to trust that the Lord will provide day by day exactly what they need. Except for on Saturday, or I should say the sixth day. The sixth day there will be double. 
the sixth day you break that pattern and you collect double because what you need on the seventh day is rest. God provides day by day what the people need. Day one, food. Day two, food. Day three, food. Day six, double the food. And day seven, what you need is rest. And again, we see that the Israelites have a bit of a learning curve there, that they get up on the seventh day and there is no manna. And so it's tr learning to trust the Lord knows and the Lord will provide exactly what you need. And on the seventh day, little Israelites, you need rest. Verse 29 is really the key verse for this morning. And it says, bear in mind that the Lord has given you the Sabbath. And that is why on the sixth day, he gave you bread for two days. Everyone is to stay where they are on the seventh day and no one is to go out. And so the people rested on the seventh day. In this verse, we see the word give or given twice. The first time it's referring to the gift of bread. And the second time it's referring to the gift of the Sabbath. He has given bread and he has given the Sabbath. The word gift or given is from the Hebrew root word Nathan, which is a name that we give our children because it means gift. So God has given bread and he has given the Sabbath. Both of these are gifts from the giver of good gifts from the Lord because he knows what we need day by day. The Lord provided food and he provided rest. Both of these were given to the Israelites and they're given to you and I. <clears throat> when the Israelites stopped from their labor, stopped from their daily tasks to rest, the heart of what God is inviting them into is into a deeper relationship with him. That when they were ceasing and they're still, they could really be reminded and to live out to the fullness of who they truly were, their true identity, and that is children of the one and only God. Secondly, when they ceased and were still and entered into that day of rest, it was they were living out the fullness of the creation design. And thirdly, they were restored and refreshed in his presence. There's not a lot that I miss about the newborn stage. There's, it's, the, these little humans are crying and flailing and wailing. And you're like, I don't know, right? <laughs> like somebody, what is going on? And it's crazy, right? And so one of my go-to things was I had this wrap, and Joel and I looked for it this morning and, and couldn't find it. Um, anyways, it was just this long, really long piece of cloth, and you wrapped it around your body in a very specific way, and the baby could just sit right in next to my chest. And I would grab the little boy, because that's what we had, boys, and... <laughs> And they would be crying. And I would know that he's fed, he's okay, but there's a panic going on in this child. And I could tuck him in to this wrap. And it did not take long for that child to go still, to calm down. And it's in that wrap where he would cease to grumble, that there would be a restoring of security and calmness. His little ear next to my heartbeat. And he would hear his mama's steady and consistent heartbeat. Thump, thump. And I think it would speak to their little bodies, you are safe, and you are loved, and you are mine. You are your mama's boy. And then you could feel their little bodies just relax and be still, and their little heartbeats come to match that steady, consistent rhythm. A steadiness would replace the frantic. A quietness would replace the noise. And a stillness would replace that flailing. And their little souls knew, I'm safe, I am loved, I'm hers. And the gift of the Sabbath is a gift of rest just like that. 
that our Heavenly Father is inviting us in the midst of our real emotions, our real worries, our real fears, in the midst of the day in and the day out of living, to cease, to stop our busyness and come close. Close enough that our ear is next to His heartbeat. And for our souls to hear, you are safe, you are loved, and you are mine. The gift of the Sabbath is a space for us to be reminded of our true identity. We are children of the one and only God. The gift of the Sabbath is an invitation to a deeper relationship with the Lord. It's also the way that creation was designed. Last week, Brandon pointed out that Adam's first full day of life was the day that the Lord rested. Like, that is pretty significant. That creation design of mankind begins with a day of rest and relationship with the Lord. The naming and caring of the animals can wait. Let's have a day together. I just think that's beautiful. <laughs> and so when we intentionally incorporate Sabbath rest into our lives. We are choosing to live in the fullness of creation design. The Lord knows what we need day by day and that we need space for Sabbath rest, time with our Lord, a day for the holy work of communing with him. Exodus 31 describes the Sabbath in a little bit more detail because where we're reading it here in Exodus 16, it's like at the beginning stages in the Israelites' life. And as we know, it quickly develops into law and different standards of what is Sabbath. So in Exodus 31, uh, God is giving a little more instruction regarding what does Sabbath look like. And in verse 12, he says, 12 and 13, And then the Lord said to Moses, Say to the Israelites, you must obey my Sabbath. This will be a sign between me and you for the generations to come, so you may know that I am the Lord who makes you holy. That the Sabbath is a sign of our covenantal relationship with the Lord, a stopping and resting in and with the Lord is countercultural. It was countercultural back then because it made them stand out amongst the other communities in that area. And it's countercultural today to choose to stop and be with God, to trust that God has provided for us day after day after day, and He's providing for us a day to rest and a day to be with Him. And he goes on to say, this sign between you and I is so that you may know that I am the Lord, but that I may also make you holy. When we cease and we stop our busy day to day, and we walk into the fullness of the creation design, we're walking into relationship, deeper relationship with the Lord, and he continues to work on us and continues to make us holy. He continues to declare over our lives, you are my child, I am making you holy. And as our ear rests on his heartbeat, we begin to experience that in a fuller way. We read in Mark 2 that man was not made for the Sabbath, but the Sabbath was made for man. The Sabbath, made, Sabbath is a custom-made gift for you and I. It's custom-designed for mankind. He didn't make Sabbath and wonder who can come and rest in this. He made man and then Sabbath. It's like, so we just got a new couch. It's not custom designed to our bodies. <laughs> you sit on it and you're like, this needs some breaking in, right? But I think there's probably some of us out here who have our favorite chair, right? That we have sat in for years upon years and you sit in it and you're like, ah, this is my chair. Or some of us have probably sat in somebody else's chair and thought, this is not my chair. <laughs> right? This is not made to my body. And that's what I think the Sabbath is designed to feel like. Where we sit in it and it's like, ah, this 
is my chair. This is my resting place, a custom designed fit for our lives. This is where, this is familiar. This is where I fit. But then truthfully, it takes time to break in that lazy boy or maybe a ball cap that fits like a glove. And I think that's same with Sabbath. It's a custom designed gift for you and for I, but it does take time to get it to feel that huh feeling, that familiar restful feeling. And I think that's okay. It's okay to take time to grow in that practice of taking a day of rest to be with the Lord. That God continues to make you holy. It's not a one time you've got it. It takes practice. And like the Israelites, maybe we'll get it wrong. Right? Trusting and practicing that trusting with our Lord. But one thing the same is with the Israelites, God is patient and forgiving. And he just longs for us to take that rest and to be with him. We read a little further in that Exodus 31 passage into verse 17. And it says he reminds the people that he too stopped from his labor during creation. And that on the seventh day he was rested and then was refreshed. Sabbath not only helps us remind us of our identity and it also is the way that creation was designed, but it also is a, a time to be refreshed and literally rested. Sabbath is a gift of refreshment, a day to be refreshed in his presence, <clears throat> a gift of relationship with the Lord to be restored and refreshed and ready for the week ahead. Back to how Adam was created, like he first rested with the Lord and then began his work. And as we take that time to rest and be refreshed, we can enter into the next week of labor ready. And I think as we put our ear to God's heart and we snuggle in with God and we're restored in our identity and worries and stresses are brought into his presence and as we gain his heartbeat and our heartbeat becomes more like his, we can walk into the week one to do our daily life tasks to collect bread, to work, to do the things that we need to do to be human. But then also to get an idea of what kingdom work that the Lord has laid out for us in the week to come. That we can leave our Sabbath rest and be ready for kingdom work. To be ready for conversations with our neighbors or people in our community about kingdom things, about Jesus. Because we have spent time near to the heartbeat of our Lord. Sabbath is a gift. It's a gift of rest, a gift of time to be in relationship with the Lord, to grow in that relationship with the Lord. So today, especially today, in the midst of our real concerns in our world, in our country, in our community, the Lord has given you this gift, like he gave the Israelites, the gift of rest to step away from all the stresses and the demands and to step into his presence. To put worries, fear, grumblings aside and choose to act in a countercultural way and to experience the fullness of a covenantal relationship with the Lord. To rest in knowing that the Lord provided manna or bread for our forefathers is the same Lord who's inviting you into his strong and secure embrace. The gift of Sabbath and rest is yours to open and to receive, to hear our Father's heartbeat loud and clear. You are safe, you are loved, and you belong to him. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, God, we thank you that you have given us a gift of Sabbath, the gift of rest. And God, we just ask that you would lead us in how do we live that out in our lives today. Would you speak to each of our hearts? 
because we know it's a custom-made gift for us. Would you speak to us how you want us to pursue you, how you want us to be in deeper relationship with you? And even today, Lord, if there's things that you want of us today that you would oh, just make that clear. Thank you for the invitation for relationship with you. In your mighty name, amen. Please take your hymnal and turn to number 405. My faith has found a resting place. Please stand. My faith has found a resting place, not in device or creed. I trust the ever-living one, his wounds for me shall plead. I need no other argument, I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died, and that he died for me. Enough for me that Jesus saves This ends my fear and doubt As sinful soul I come to hear He'll never cast me out I need no other argument I need no other plea it is enough that Jesus died, and that he died for me. My heart is leaning on the word, the written word of God. Salvation by my Savior's name, salvation through his blood. I need no other argument, I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. My great physician heals the sick, the lost he came to save. For me his precious blood he shed, for me his life he gave. I need no other argument, I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died, and that he died for me. Please be seated. We'll now proclaim our affirmation of faith with the Apostles' Creed. Let us firm together, affirm together the faith we share in Christ. We believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. We believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Savior, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit 
born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated on the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. <clears throat> the Lord is here. Let us or lift up your hearts. <laughs> Let us give thanks to the Lord. Blessed are you, Lord God, our Good Shepherd, for through your finished work in Jesus Christ, you invite us into your rest. We fear no evil, for you have given yourself to us. Your Spirit is our comforter. We gladly thank you with saints and angels praising you and saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of might and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Our closing hymn is number 460, All the Way My Savior Leads Me. And we'll sing the first verse. Please stand. All the way my Savior leads me, what have I to ask beside? Can I doubt his tender mercy? Who through life has been my guide? Heavenly peace, divinest comfort, here by faith in him to dwell. For I know whate'er befall me, Jesus doeth all things well. For I know whate'er befall me, Jesus doeth all things well. God's blessing in our parting benediction comes from Psalm 91. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. May you go and dwell in the shelter of your Lord, so that you may rest in his shadow. May God love you and bless you guys this week. Amen. <clears throat>